Everyone is a post-millennial at Christmas. Merry Christmas is more than just a seasonal greeting. It's an exhortation to be joyful and to rejoice in the knowledge that Jesus Christ has been born. To be merry is more than a feeling of happiness, though it includes that. To be merry is to act in a particularly joyful way. It is to do what Nehemiah 8.10 calls us to do. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That is what it is to celebrate a merry Christmas. To be merry this Christmas means to rejoice in Christ's birth as we joyfully feast with family and friends. It means allowing our merrymaking to spill over into generosity for all. So that, like Ebenezer Scrooge, having been visited by ghosts all night long, we wake to open tight-fisted hands so that we may joyfully give to others because we have received so much from Jesus. Most Christians intuitively do this around Christmas time, especially as we celebrate Christ's birth, advent, and incarnation. In fact, the celebration of the first advent of our Lord and Savior is typically punctuated in most of our churches and even in our families by the singing of Christmas carols and hymns. And wondrously, at the grand risk of angering some, we all sing and sound like postmillennialists at Christmas time. Consider the postmillennial hymns and carols. One of my longstanding personal favorites is Isaac Watts' Joy to the World. And the verses go like this. I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry. I'll just read it for you. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. In recent years, I've heard many suggest that this song is actually not written about Jesus' first advent, but his second coming. For what it's worth, there are certainly some lines and aspects of the song that could be interpreted to be referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. We know, for example, that when Christ returns to this earth, he will rule with truth and grace, and sins and sorrows and thorns will no longer infest the earth. They will no longer be part of our lives. For this earth and all that is in it will be made new. And that which is sinful, that which is wicked and wretched, it'll burn eternally in the lake of fire as it is judged by God. And so Jesus will totally renovate the cosmos in such a way that it will actually be better than what Eden was like for Adam and Eve before they first sinned. So I don't have a problem with singing joy to the world all year long. In fact, I've requested sometimes at church that we sing Joy to the World in July. But I do think it's important to see here that what Isaac Watts was depicting was not only the second coming of Jesus, nor was he simply depicting the first advent of Jesus Christ either. Rather, 
Joy to the World depicts to us how Jesus' first advent leads directly into his millennial reign as king. That is to say, as a rather staunch post-millennialist, Isaac Watts wrote Joy to the World because he believed that Jesus' first coming had disarmed Satan and all of his works at the cross. And he believed that Jesus' second coming would truly bring an end to evil, wickedness, death, and sin. But Watts also believed that in between these two cataclysmic events that shape time and creation, that the gospel would go forth, sinners would be saved, all of the elect brought into the kingdom of God, the nations would be discipled, and the earth would truly be conquered by faithful Christians in preparation of the returning King Jesus. But this doesn't simply end with joy to the world. This whole idea of having a Merry Christmas is repeated in some of the most famous Christmas hymns and carols of all time. Consider some of the lines from O Holy Night. Here it is written, O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, night divine, O oh, night when Christ was born. This is also another one of my favorite hymns to sing with our church at Christmas time. But as you hear some of those lines, as you sing them, as you hear me speak them now, we need to ask the question, why is there a thrill of hope in which the weary world now rejoices? Well, the answer is because Christ has been born. This same Christ defeats the sin and error which our entire world has been subjected to. And it gets better. Later in the second verse, we sing these words. The king of kings lay thus in lowly manger in all our trials born to be our friend. He knows our need to our weakness is no stranger. Behold your king before him lowly bend. So we bow the knee or bend the knee to Christ our king. But wait a second. Who in this hymn is being directed to bend the knee to Christ? Well, it's not just the Christian, is it? No, no, no. It is the entire world that is commanded to bend the knee before Christ the King. For this Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And making this point even stronger is then the third verse of All Holy Night, which continues. Truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother. And in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. So we see here that Jesus' gospel brings us peace with God, peace with one another in the body of Christ, and our obedience to his law is born from a heart that loves God because God first loved us. In this we find joy. And as Nehemiah 8.10 said, it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why at Christmas time we find renewed energy, renewed strength to serve the Lord because we're filled with joy. And not only this, O Holy Night reminds us that Jesus breaks the chains that bound us to sin. He ends the oppression. And as our Lord, he receives everlasting praise from us as we glorify him forevermore. 
For, as 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we would be made the righteousness of God in him. That is a reason to be merry this Christmas. And if those two hymns weren't enough, let's consider one more, a third Christmas hymn or Christmas carol, and perhaps it's the oldest one on this list, God rest ye, merry gentlemen. And from what I can find, it probably dates from the 15th century, but perhaps even prior to that. And of course, in this song, which I'm sure all are familiar with, we sing the words, God rest ye, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. And then, towards the end of the song, we sing, Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place, and with true love and brotherhood, each other new embrace. This holy tide of Christmas, all other doth deface. So, even here, we see that our reason to be merry is because the birth of Jesus, through which the gospel comes to us, has already happened. It's taken place. Jesus saves us from Satan's power and tyranny over us. In fact, all tyrants are displaced because the rightful ruler and king has come. And the season of Christmas defaces all others precisely because it speaks of the incarnation and advent of Jesus, which is the hinge upon which the death, burial, and resurrection all depend. Christmas, when understood in this sense, stands high above all other days because no other day, outside of Easter Sunday, the day we celebrate the resurrection, no other day so clearly declares Christ is King. Christ is Lord. This is reason to be merry indeed. So, Let's be Christmas Christians all year long. It was Charles Dickens who personified the spirit of Christmas in his story, A Christmas Carol. The first rendition that I ever saw of it, though, was the Muppets version. And it's still one of my favorite Christmas movies to this day, actually, alongside A Christmas Vacation. And if you've seen The Muppets, A Christmas Carol, you know that the spirit of Christmas in that movie is a big Muppet, but he's jolly, he's merry, and he's a loving fellow. And he sings a pretty fun song, too. Now, in reality, there's no such thing as a spirit of Christmas. There is, however, a Holy Spirit. And he has indwelled all of us who profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And what this means, then, is that we don't need to wait for one day out of the year to be filled with hope and joy. Christmas is merry, but we can be merry Christians all year round. Dare I say, we can be post-millennial Christians all year round. So, friends, let's stop just dipping our toes into the water of post-millennialism once a year to test things out, to only then jump out for 364 days out of the year come December 26th. The water here is fine. Jump on in. Embrace the hope of Christmas year-round. For as Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 tells us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it. With justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And I love this part. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The kingdom is Christ's, and his rule 
will be eternal. His kingdom, currently, is advancing across the earth. And when he returns, he will find this earth conquered for his glory, as the gospel was proclaimed and the nations were discipled. And this is certain, for it is the Lord's own zeal that carries out this world-conquering, glory-spreading task. We sing about this in our Christmas hymns. But let's believe it all year round. Joy to the world, because Jesus on that holy night came long ago. And praise the Lord, he's coming back again. He is the reigning, defending, conquering God King of the cosmos. And through his body on earth, the church, he makes his truth, grace, and love known to the nations. He spreads his mercy abroad. And as this happens, his glory spreads and the works of wickedness, the works of Satan, are further diminished. Because the Savior reigns, all creation is brought to its knees. Some, whose hearts have been prepared for him, rejoice in him with song, while others are forced to admit that they are simply unable to stand before his wrath. And that's the beauty of Christmas time, isn't it? When we praise Jesus for his first advent, we longingly look to his second coming. Yet, Hymns like Joy to the World, O Holy Night, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, and many others teach us that our time between Jesus' first and second advents are not to be spent just twiddling our thumbs. They remind us that our work matters. They remind us of the post-millennial hope. So, regardless of your position on eschatology, I wish you a very Merry Christmas. Now go forth, conquer this world for the glory of Christ, and be a merry Christian all year round. Seated here at my right hand, the Lord to my Lord did command for all these ye that I will make a kingly Stool for your sake.